Dickens lives on, and he lives on particularly with John Jordan and the Dickens Project, and it's a great pleasure. My, my former colleague at Merrill, uh, who uh, suffered my visits, visitors from South Africa and got involved in, in South African literature, mm -hmm. but in all sorts of literature, but is the spark behind the Dickens Project, John Jordan. John, thank you. So thank you very much, John. And thank you for inviting me uh, to talk to you about the Dickens Project. Um, and I see many friends and, and colleagues uh, in the room. So thank you all for coming. Um, Dickens was born on February 7th, 1812. And you had to be either asleep or seriously not paying attention in the early months of this year not to realize that this is the 200th anniversary of Dickens' birth. And there has been a lot of attention to Dickens uh, in the popular press, in, uh, um, on TV. Uh, BBC has made several uh, new masterpiece theater versions of Dickens' novels. And um, I was personally interviewed by, oh, 15 or 20 journalists from, uh, from China to uh, Australia to the UK uh, about Dickens because the people look for Dickens on the web and they find the Dickens Project and they see my name and so somebody calls me up and wants me to explain why Dickens is still important to read today. Um, I went to a conference in, uh, in Britain on February 7th, or for that, that week, the week preceding, and attended a wreath laying at Westminster Abbey where Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall were present. There was a dinner at the Lord Mayor's uh, house in, in London, um, and it was just a, a, a big to-do. I can tell you more about the bicentenary and, and uh, the various events that are have been happening and, and are continuing to happen um, this year. Uh, but what I really want to do today is to tell you about the Dickens Project, to tell you about the history of, of the Dickens Project. And if, um, if there's time at the end, I can talk a, a little bit about um, um, th some of my own work on, on, on Dickens. But first, I want to explain a couple of things. One is that the reason that I am being videoed, filmed, is that my good friend Michael Cowan, uh, whom I ran into at the, at the library a couple of weeks ago, said, you know, we really ought to do an oral history of the Dickens Project. And so this, this video is for our purposes, <laughs> really to try and, uh, you know, preserve my memory, which is fading rapidly, I promise you, uh, about the, how we got started and um, things that have happened over the years. So I hope you will indulge me in, in going back down memory lane. John has already said a couple of things about how we got, got started. Um, and then uh, there is a, a, a one-page handout that I think all of you received that tells you a little bit, sort of a, you know, a thumbnail sketch of, of the Dickens Project as it is today with some 35, 37 universities that are members of this research um, consortium. And there is also, if you are at McHenry Library, a, um, an exhibit outside of special collections on the third floor that has um, various items, scholarly publications, uh, t-shirts, memorabilia, um, uh, from the history of the Dickens Project in the cases outside of, um, in the hallway outside of special collections. So that's, that's another um, if, if you will, that we are celebrating Dickens on this campus as, as well. And um, I also want, before I, I guess I've begun, but before I go any further, to introduce two colleagues of, of mine. One is Ed Eigner, who is uh, at the table over here. Ed raises his hand. Uh, Ed is a professor emeritus of English from UC Riverside, and he was, along with Murray Baumgarten and, and myself, uh, one of the founders of the Dickens Project back in 1981. And then also Joanna Rotke, raise your hand, is the coordinator of the Dickens Project, uh, the staff person who 
um, really makes the Dickens Project work. I'm the figurehead. Anyone who's had a valuable staff member can attest to how that works. So um, the history of the Dickens Project. First, the origin story. And the origin story is always a myth, right? So in the beginning, uh, in the beginning, there were three of us. Um, in the beginning, there were two of us. Murray had come to the campus in 1966 at Stevenson. I came to the campus in 1968 at Merrill. And we both, both worked on, on um, 19th century British literature. And, uh, but Murray was at Stevenson, and I was up the hill at Merrill. And we were, we were personal friends, but we didn't really have an intellectual friendship. So we decided that we wanted to become intellectual colleagues. And so two things happened. One was that in, I think I've got the year right, 1979, 80, there was reaggregation. Do you remember reaggregation where everyone stood up and moved around and sat down again, re musical chairs? Hmm? Reog. Reog, yeah, okay. Um, and so Murray and I stood up and, and then sat down again at Kresge College where our offices were across the hall from each other. So that was one step toward becoming closer um, intellectual colleagues. And the second step was that we decided we would teach a course together. So what was the course going to be? And we decided we would teach a course on Dickens. Um, and um, so Murray then said, oh, my, my good friend Ed Eigner uh, at Riverside is also teaching a Dickens course this quarter. So why don't we go and visit Ed's course and have Ed come up and visit our course? So we did that, and it was fun. And um, we said, well, you know, there, we looked around, and in the UC system, there were Dickens scholars on every UC campus except for San Diego. So we said, maybe we could get all the Dickens people together. And, and, uh, and then uh, Murray found out, I forget exactly how, that there was a fund for intercampus cooperation up at the office of the president. So we applied, and we got some money for a planning grant in the summer of 1980. So Murray and Ed and I got together and we sat in the backyard at Murray's house uh, downtown and we came up with, um, with an idea for what we thought of as a one-off conference that we would have the following summer. And we would bring these Dickens scholars from the different UC campuses uh, to Santa Cruz, and but we didn't really just want to bring the scholars. We thought we really ought to bring some graduate students as well. So we decided that it would be one Dickens scholar from each campus, and then there would be um, a couple of grad students from each campus, except for San Diego, who didn't have any. And um, so, uh, but behind this, there there was a more ambitious or subversive idea about graduate education, which is that when Murray and Ed and I talked about our own graduate student experience, uh, none of us had ever met a graduate student from another campus. We were in those little silos that were departments. We knew the other people in our department, but we never had occasions to talk with a graduate student from another campus who was working on the same stuff that we were. So the idea was to bring graduate students together with faculty, all of whom were interested in more or less the same period, same kind of stuff. Um, but um, what are the graduate students going to do? That was, that was the next question. What are they going to do? Are they just going to sit at the feet of the, of the professors and listen to the talks that the faculty give? So I think it was Ed who had the idea, no, let, let's invite Let's find some high school teachers and invite high school teachers to come. And uh, so the high school students will be the audience, and then the graduate students will lead sections, uh, discussion sections for the high school teachers. So that seemed like a good idea. But the, so that's where we began the outreach dimension to, uh, to the Dickens Project. So from, from the beginning, it was faculty, graduate students, and then um, non-specialist, non-professional uh, people from the community, mostly high school teachers. So the first year, so then, there, no, then a couple of other things. 
Um, Murray had the vision. M Murray, Murray, if you know Murray, Murray, Murray thinks big. Murray is a, is a visionary. Murray, Murray was the one who had the big ideas. Ed was the one who named it. He said, let's call this event the Dickens Universe, because it includes so many people. And I was the junior member. I was the guy who did the legwork. I ran and took care of things, made, made, you know, made it happen. Um, and uh, then the other idea was that each summer, each, or each uh, this first summer, we would focus on a single book. Everybody would be reading the same book. So the book that we picked was Great Expectations, which is um, relatively short in the Dickens canon, and which is also the most widely read, most widely taught of any of the Dickens novels in uh, American high schools. So we had the first conference, uh, first Dickens universe, uh, in the summer of 1981. And there were uh, 10 faculty, a dozen graduate students, and as best I recall, 75 high school teachers, mostly high school teachers, who, who showed up. And we, we started on Sunday night. And uh, the idea was to go from Sunday until the following Friday. We would end on Friday, Friday night. So we had a um, lecture on, on Sunday night, a uh, lecture on Monday night. And then on Monday afternoon, we had a revolt. Because the high school teachers came up to us and they said, we didn't come here to listen to formal academic lectures. We want you to be real people. We just want you to talk to us a, 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 about Dickens. So the faculty met that afternoon, and they said, damn it, we have written these lectures. We're <laughs> going to give them. We're not going to make any concessions to, to these people. So, so some of the teachers left. They, they just walked out. And we thought, you know, this, is, this thing is never going to fly. But we persisted, and we gave, we gave our, our, our lectures. And um, it was successful enough so that we decided maybe we could do this again. So, um, but we had made one other mistake, we realized, which was to have everyone, the faculty, the graduate students, and the members of the general public, the teachers, show up on Sunday. And so it was, Sunday was chaos. So for the next year, uh, we decided that we would start, we would get the faculty and graduate students to come on Friday. Then we would get the general public to come on Sunday. And then we would add on a conference at the end that would go through the following weekend. So the whole thing was going to be two weeks long instead of one week. So um, Murray at that point was working on Thomas Carlyle. And he, he actually had begun a scholarly edition of the principal works of, of Thomas Carlyle. And so um, the faculty, there was the, at the beginning, the Carlyle people got together Friday, Saturday, uh, sort of a mini conference on Carlisle. Then uh, the Universe Week was on A Tale of Two Cities, the second most popular of Dickens's novels, and one heavily influenced by Carlisle's French Revolution. And then we had a weekend conference at the end on Dickens and Carlisle. And we, we sent out a call for papers, and there were people from other universities who showed up. So the mistake that we made the second year <laughs> was that two weeks is just too long. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, you know, people started dropping uh, away. They didn't want to stay. They couldn't sacrifice two weeks of their summer for an event like this. So um, we realized that we, we couldn't do that. So for, uh, but it was still, it was pretty successful. And we had applied for funding to the vice chancellors of each of the campuses. So John Markham was the vice chancellor at that time. And John gave us $5,000, and each of the uh, vice chancellors at the other UCs gave us $5,000. So that was the, the funding beyond the initial uh, seed money from this intercampus cooperation fund. And uh, so the third year, uh, we, we, did, uh, we, we changed the format. We had the, the faculty and graduate students arrive on Friday for two days of um, pre-conference seminars where the faculty and graduate students settled in. They got to know each other. They um, learned the camp song and the handshake and, and all of that, uh, and uh, uh, knew how to get around the campus, which is always a challenge at Santa Cruz. And then the members of the general public arrived on Sunday night 
And then we went through, and then we kept the weekend conference, but the weekend conference started on uh, Thursday. So there was a new group of people, not from the UCs, who arrived on Thursday. So um, there were really sort of three stages, the pre-conference faculty and graduate students, the um, universe week, which was focused on the single novel. Uh, third year was Oliver Twist. And then the weekend conference at the end with strangers coming in, and that was on um, Dickens and film, because Oliver Twist is a novel that has had many f interesting film adaptations uh, done uh, about it. So that was the, the format, and that has been more or less the, the format that we followed uh, for a while. Um, the fourth year, I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm not going to tell you all every year in the 32 years of the, of the history of the Dickens Project. But the fourth year, uh, we realized that, that we, we, had, we were on a roll. We had, we had something good going because uh, the members of the general public, not the ones who had walked out the first year, but the ones who had come back the second and, and, and third years, had told their friends about it, and we were getting um, retired people. Uh, we were getting not just high school teachers. The audience for this had, had grown, and that says something about Dickens and who is reading um, Dickens. Um, so uh, we decided in the fourth year that we would we would bite the bullet, so to speak, and we would do, we'd, we'd done um, Great Expectations, Tale of Two Cities, Oliver Twist. Those are, you know, three of the best known Dickens novels. So the fourth year we decided we, we, would, we would do one of the big ones. Um, all, all those three I just mentioned are all relatively short in the Dickens canon. And we would do Martin Chuzzlewit. Martin Chuzzlewit is not the best known uh, or the favorite novel of people who read uh, Dickens. It's, uh, it's a novel relatively early in his career, uh, and it includes um, some stuff about his, about he sends the characters to America, so there's the, you know, some American scenes in it. So uh, we did uh, Martin Chuzzlewit, and we had a weekend conference on Dickens and Twain, and that seemed like a, a good pair. Uh, Mark Twain had actually seen Dickens do a public reading in 1867 or 1868 when Dickens came the second time to um, the United States. And there are ways in which Twain and Dickens are similar sensibilities. Um, there are ways in which they're very different. And one of the um, papers at the weekend conference on Dickens and Twain was um, a, a, a paper the entitled Dickens Doubles Twain Twins. And there are a lot of doubles, du paired characters in Dickens novels, and there are a lot of twins in, uh, in, in Mark Twain's. So the paper was on comp a comparison of Twain and, and Dickens doubles and, and twins. And that paper was given by a pair of scholars, quite appropriately <laughs> enough. Uh, one of them was uh, Bob Patton from Rice University and his younger colleague, Susan Gilman. Uh, Susan Gilman is now the chair of the Academic Senate on this campus, but the first time that she came to Santa Cruz was for a Dickens conference. So that's another just tiny piece of, of Dickens project history of its intersection with, um, with Santa Cruz. But one of the things that was happening as a, as a result of the um, participation of scholars from universities other than the University of California is that people would show up, the, the scholars who would show up on Thursday and they'd walk in and, and there would be this party going on, <laughs> uh, this, this universe with people who were having a really good time and they would say, how can we get to be part of the action? So um, the first university that joined was uh, the Graduate Center City University of New York because Fred Kaplan who taught at the Graduate Center, had written a biography of Thomas Carlyle and was in the process of writing a biography of Dickens. So uh, Fred came regularly, and he every summer he would read another chapter in the biography that he was writing of, uh, of Dickens. And he was also participating in the Carlyle. And then in the 
uh, the year when we did uh, Dick, the Dickens and Carlisle Conference, uh, uh, a, a woman from the University of Texas at Austin, Carol McKay, came. And so uh, Fred got the Graduate Center City University to join the Dickens Project as a, as a member of this consortium. Carol got the University of Texas at Austin to join. In the, th um, uh, the fourth year, Rob Paul Hemus came down from Stanford, and he got Stanford to join. Uh, and so that's how we began to involve universities other than the uh, UC system in the, the Dickens Project. And as we progress through, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you every year, um, as, we, as we continued to hold the, uh, the Dickens universe every, every summer, um, our network grew larger. Um, people heard about us. People wanted to join. Uh, they, uh, they, they liked the idea of, of graduate education that we had, had conceived from the very beginning that is, of uh, scholars and graduate students in residence. That's, that's an important part of the concept, is that many scholarly conferences, at least in, in my discipline, are weekend conferences where people breeze in, they breeze out, they talk to their buddies, but they really don't spend any time uh, talking to younger scholars, or they spend very little time doing that. There's not enough time. But if you get people to Santa Cruz, beautiful campus, living in the dorms, eating the dorm food and complaining about it, but that's a bonding experience. It's a, it's a, it's a, little, bit, it's a little bit like, and the analogy has, has, been, has been pushed, it's a little bit like Dickens' summer camp. And um, in fact, the Dickens universe, as it has grown, has, has benefited from this from the isolation of the campus, the beauty of the campus. And another thing that happened is that one of the high school teachers, a, a, a woman um, named Barbara Keller, who's from Redwood City, um, came to me and said, uh, John, uh, th there's not enough for us to do during the day, because what you have is a morning lecture. And then in the afternoon, there's lots of free time. And the graduate students are having seminars with the, with the faculty in the afternoon. And then there's an evening lecture. And then maybe you show a film in the, in the evening. But you know we're here on this beautiful campus. And some people don't have transportation. What are we going to do? So, so I said, OK, well, maybe we should think up some other things to happen. So we decided to increase the number of small group activities. So starting at 8.30 in the morning, there would be what we called a context group that would be about uh, social history, Victorian backgrounds, Dickens biography, things like that. Then there would be a morning lecture. Then uh, following the morning lecture, there would be the, the sections led by graduate students teaching in teams of two. One of the other concepts that Murray was big on, and it was there from the very beginning, was the buddy system. That things, are, things go a lot better when you've got a friend to, to work with. So in the Dickens Project, we, we try to do everything in teams of two, or at least two. So the graduate students were teaching in teams of two, not with a graduate student from the same campus, but with a graduate student from a different campus. And if you've ever done any team teaching, you know that that's another way to get to know someone as an intellectual colleague. So that was beneficial. Um, then we decided that we would have um, uh, Barbara, the, the high school teacher from uh, Redwood City, lead a, um, a workshop for high school teachers on the teaching of Dickens at the secondary level, Dickens and uh, other 19th century novels. So we had a kind of master class for teachers uh, running in the afternoon. And then another um, uh, regular participant, a man from Chicago, uh, a retired businessman named Herbert First, who had found a second career as an antiquarian book dealer. Um, came to me and said, uh, you know, we, we really should, you, you should have a way to perpetuate this organization, and you need a fundraising arm. And so he said, let's form a group called the Friends of the Dickens Project, and we will raise money for you, and one of the things that we will do is to uh, give you money to bring in scholars who are not part of the consortium. And from the very beginning, British scholars had been aware that we existed. I remember the, the first year that, um, that we had the, the universe, 1981, 
we received a telegram. Remember telegrams? You know, nobody gets <laughs> telegrams anymore. We got a telegram from uh, David Parker, who was the uh, director of the Dickens House Museum in London. And uh, he said, congratulations on your, on your conference. And then he quoted a line from the Pickwick Papers, uh, where there's a medical student who, whose name is Bob Sawyer. And you need to appreciate the joke in Sawyer, because he's a sawbones. That's what doctors were in the 19th century. So Bob Sawyer, um, uh, like many medical students, has a rather grim sense of humor. And he says, nothing like dissecting to give someone an appetite. So he said, that's what, that's what the Dickens universe was, was dissecting Dickens. Um, so British scholars were aware of this. And then Herb first said, let's raise some money, and we'll bring uh, British scholars to the Dickens universe. So Philip Collins was the, the first of the scholars from, the, um, from England to come. And Philip was uh, an irascible old man who um, it was a, a real Dickensian character. There are many characters in Dickens' novels, and there are many characters in the Dickens universe. Um, and Philip came the year that we did um, Martin Chuzzlewit. So he was there for the Dickens and Twain uh, weekend conference. And Philip was, um, among his many talents, was a reader, not an impersonator. But Dick Dickens, as you probably know, um, in addition to writing his novels, did uh, public readings from his novels and toured around England, came to the United States, gave readings here, uh, gave readings in France. Um, and so Philip, in the tradition of Dickens as a public reader, uh, gave readings from, from Dickens. And that year, we also had a Mark Twain impersonator that someone had. So I remember a kind of face-off that took place at Kresge College between Philip Collins and the Twain impersonator, where they sort of tried to outdo each other. And it was, uh, you know, again, one of these moments in the, the, the history of the Dickens project. And Philip then became a regular. He loved the Dickens universe because he liked reaching out to the non-academic uh, part of the Dickens audience. So the Dickens Project is growing. We're, we're continuing to get funded uh, by going to the vice chancellor, asking for $5,000 each year. But some of the vice chancellors are getting restive. And they're saying, if this thing is going to continue, uh, if it's going to be an annual event, then the office of the president ought to take it over and ought to fund it centrally. So. Uh, in the meantime, Murray, um, always the man with the vision, is doing two things. One is he's saying, John, you've got to take over as director of the Dickens Project. You know, any, anyone who found something has got to have an exit strategy. I have not found my exit strategy. Um, so Murray handed things over to me in 1986, and I've been the director since 1986. And I, 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 um, I would like to find someone to be my successor, but there's no logical person in the literature department at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, but Murray's other vision, uh, thinking big, was that we needed to become permanent as a line item in the Office of the President budget. And in order to do that, um, his idea was that the Dickens Project should become an MRU. So he started an application to become a multi-campus research unit of the University of California. And um, we wrote a proposal. We started sending it through the campus bureaucracy. It went through the Graduate Council. Uh, it went to the Vice Chancellor. It went up to CCGA. Um, it went to the Office of the President. And it caused something of a crisis in the Office of the President Office of Research, because there was no such thing as an MRU in the humanities. MRUs were for the hard sciences only. They were for Lick Observatory. They were for other uh, scientific operations. There was no, there were a couple of social science MRUs, um, but nothing in the humanities. So we caused a, a taxonomic crisis in the Office of Research at the Office of the President. How to accommodate a group of, of humanists. And Murray's concept, again, from, from the beginning, was that the Dickens Project should be a laboratory. 
It should be modeled on the scientific laboratory to the extent that you can adapt that model to the humanities. That is to say that the faculty who came and gave lectures or who taught graduate seminars or did any other kind of work should be paid. They should have their transportation to the laboratory paid. They should be paid for the labor that they perform. And not only the faculty, but the graduate students should have their transportation paid. And they should get a stipend for the work that they do, teaching the members of the general public. So the budget that we were getting from John Markham and the other vice chancellors was being used for, for all of that. But in the meantime, some of the vice chancellors were defecting and saying, OP, you've got to pay for this if you want to. And uh, in, in, at the same time, how to classify a humanities MRU. Is there such a thing as a humanities laboratory? So the office of the president um, decided that they, they would create a kind of alphabet soup. So they said there are MRUs that are mostly in the sciences. There are MRPs, multi-campus research projects. Um, and then there are MRGs. Those are the minnows swimming in the big sea of, uh, you know, along with the whales and the, and, and the sharks. So the Dickens Project was classified as an MRG, the smallest and, of course, the poorest funded of the uh, multi-campus research entities. Um, and our application for that status was still pending. We finally did get declared an, uh, an MRG with um, funding from the office of the president in 1993, after we had a review that said, this is an outstanding research group. Its publications are, are excellent. It's also educating graduate students. It's also doing a wonderful job of reaching out to uh, a non-academic public. So uh, in the meantime, <laughs> uh, the, the project is growing. And it's growing because of the, um, uh, the, the scholars who are coming in for the weekend conferences who are saying, how do I get my institution to join? And so we said, yeah, we, we'll, we'll welcome you into the consortium, but you will have to join on the same basis as the UCs. That is to say, you will have to pay for the participation of your faculty and your graduate students. You'll have to pay for their transportation. Uh, you'll have to pay for the honoraria that they receive, and you will also have to pay us a membership fee. And so uh, the, uh, we continue to grow. Uh, scholars, joining, um, scholars joining from universities outside of the United States. The first of those was the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where Murray had a friend. Murray had been the EAP director at Jerusalem. And so his friend Bill Dulesky, who was also a Dickens scholar, uh, got the Hebrew University to send participants. And um, another way that, that we joined is that some of the graduate got, uh, that we grew is that some of the graduate students uh, who had come through the Dickens Project um, wanted, uh, after they finished their degrees and went out into the world, wanted to get the universities where they got jobs to join. So we had a kind of alumni group that was bringing universities in. And then Murray, um, again, Murray the visionary. I, you know, all, this is really a hymn to, to Murray Baumgarten. Um, Murray, uh, whenever we, we would get someone from another university to show up who showed real interest, we, Murray would say, well, you know, you've come to Santa Cruz. Um, now it's your turn to host a conference on your campus. So we began to have conferences that were located elsewhere. Carol McKay had a conference at UT Austin. Uh, we went to Jerusalem and did a, did a conference on homes and homelessness in Victorian, in Dickens and Victorian England with a volume of essays that was published based on that. Um, I was in touch with a French Dickens scholar, the, the greatest Dickens scholar of, in the history of French literature, a man named Sylvain Monod. So we, uh, we had a conference in Dijon. Um, um, I became interested, thanks to my having been at Merrill College uh, in my early years, I, I, where I had taught in the core course on Africa and got to know John Markham um, as, a, as a colleague. I became interested in African literature. And we invited a South African colleague to come and give a paper at one of the weekend conferences. And we said to him, you've got to organize a conference in South Africa. So off we go to South Africa. We have a South Africa conference. Um, 
uh, an Australian colleague comes, a conference in Sydney, uh, a conference at Exeter in, in, in the UK, um, conference in Genoa, conference in, on Lake Garda in Mussolini's villa on, on, on Lake Garda. You know, this, this is Murray just sort of waving his hands and saying, why don't you, why don't you do something for us? And people, uh, you know, and behind all of this is, is Dickens, you know. Um, Dickens is a lot of fun. Um, Dickens is, is a great writer. He's, he's you know, next to Shakespeare, maybe even parallel to Shakespeare, the greatest writer in, in English literature. Um, and uh, people who read Dickens, people who study Dickens, like to eat, they like to drink, they like to party, they have a good time. All of that sort of stuff is going on in, in Dickens' novels. And so the, the people who joined the Dickens Project were hospitable people who wanted to welcome us to what they were doing. So again, Murray is waving his hands and saying, why don't you do this? Um, we decided that we should apply to the National Endowment for the Humanities. And in addition to the Dickens universe in the summer, we should have um, institutes for high school and college teachers. So the first one was Ed's Institute at, at UC San Diego. Um, uh, uh, he held it at UC San Diego because that was a nicer place than, than UC Riverside to be in the, in the summer. And, um, and uh, um, so, so uh, uh, then I did a, an NEH high school institute and Murray did a high school institute. And um, uh, then we decided, uh, maybe Mark Twain is somewhere in the background of this idea that, that you know, it takes a lot of effort to put on this conference every summer and to do an NEH Institute. So we would use the Tom Sawyer approach and get somebody else to paint our fence for us. Uh, so we got some of our Dickens Project colleagues we, to apply for NEH Institutes and seminars that would be held at Santa Cruz under the auspices of the Dickens Project, but with someone other than Murray or me or Ed as the director of that. So we've had a series of NEH institutes. Um, the BBC heard about us. And the BBC, as you know, does regular, you know, masterpiece theater, the costume drama adaptations of Dickens novels on a pretty regular basis. And they also, this is less well known, they also do um, teaching resource kits for teachers who want to use the masterpiece theater adaptations to teach Dickens in the schools. And so uh, whom do they ask to consult with them about that? Do they ask any British scholars? No, they come to California and they ask the Dickens Project to be the scholars who will tell them uh, what is going on in Martin Chuzzlewit, what is going on in, in hard times, and so on. So um, the people who bought the, the copyright to the classics illustrated comic book versions of Dickens, decided that they wanted to get into the classroom market too. And so they, um, these, the, the people who hold the copyright decided that they wanted to compete with the Cliff Notes versions of Dickens' novels and produce the comic books with notes teacher guides in the back. So where do they come? They come to the Dickens Project, and they ask us to provide notes to put in the back of the classics illustrated comic books on the Dickens novels in that series. So we get the graduate students affiliated with us to write the, the teaching resource material that's in the back of the classic comic books. You can see how this thing is it's just spinning off stuff all, all over the place. Um, the, um, what else is there to, to tell you about it? So we're, we're, we're now funded centrally out of the office of the president. We are, they finally gave up the alphabet soup of the MRG, MRP, MRU, and they said, okay, you're, a, you're an MRU. So the Dickens Project is an MRU with central funding from the office of the president. Flash forward um, to 2009, and during the intervening years, one of the things that has happened is that funding for the Dickens Project, central funding, is becoming harder to get. The uh, Dean of Humanities doesn't have as much money in his pocket to give to us. 
Um, Office of the President is sending warning signals that you know, they, they may not be able to continue uh, their funding. And in 2009, um, there was a, um, a complete overhaul of the MRU system in the University of California. And they held what they called a re-competition. A re-competition uh, was uh, uh, an event in which all um, existing MRUs were asked to submit proposals for their future based not on what they had accomplished up to that point, but on what they uh, proposed to do in the future. And then new groups who were interested in becoming MRUs uh, were asked to submit proposals, and everyone was supposed to compete on the same basis. What was really behind this recompetition in the newly configured Office of Research at the Office of the President was a decision, which I understand, to phase out um, the old MRUs, or a lot of the old MRUs. Um, and the Dickens Project had been funded since 1993, centrally, and earlier than that even, if before we became a, a, an official MRU. So we entered the recompetition. Um, I somewhat naively thought that with this outstanding track record of research and publication and graduate education and uh, you know, by then some 30-odd universities from uh, all around the world, stretching from Melbourne to, to Tel Aviv, uh, that we would again get refunded. We were not uh, funded in the recompetition. And it was um, political, yes, uh, but it was also, I think, uh, the Office of Research had realized that uh, because there was no um, real, there were, there were no sunset clauses in MRGs. There was no way to disestablish an MRU. That in order to create new research entities, groups in uh, the University of California, they had to defund some of the existing ones. So we were the ones to get defunded. Um, by then, we had lost all of our funding from the campus. Um, the um, Dean of Humanities had cut all research funds for research groups, and um, except for the um, IHR, the Institute for Humanities Research, that is a kind of umbrella for, uh, for humanities research. And, um, uh, but the Office of the President uh, gave us nothing. They gave us a, a, you know, a half a year of transition funding and said, you've got you've to make it on your own. Um, so uh, this had serious implications for our, our funding and really for our, our existence because it meant that we had now to be self-sustaining. How, how are we going to do this? And um, the sources of income that we had at that point were the monies that were being raised by the Friends of the Dickens Project, this uh, affiliate group that was doing annual fundraising appeals. Uh, the memberships from the um, non-UC universities who were paying us $1,500 a year, and, um, and then private gifts. And uh, so we, we had to look hard. Uh, no, excuse me. Uh, private gifts were coming in through the Friends of the Dickens Project, the registrations for the Dickens Universe. So we had to increase the amount of money that we charge for uh, the... Dickens Universe um, members of the general public in the, in the summer. The faculty and graduate students still pay nothing. We had to do away with the stipends and the travel support for them. Um, but in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2011, um, we had some, some very good things uh, began to happen for us. One is that um, through a friend of a friend, we uh, managed to get uh, an article, a full-length article, 10, 11 pages about the Dickens universe in the New Yorker magazine. Uh, the author of this was Jill Lepore. Jill Lepore is a historian at Harvard, and Harvard had been a member of, of, the, of the consortium, but um, had dropped out. They said they could no longer afford to pay the $1,500 membership. Harvard, of all places, couldn't, couldn't, aff couldn't afford this. My, my, friends, my friends at LSU, at, at Louisiana State, 
University are having bake sales so that they can continue to be members of the consortium. And Harvard can't afford to, to, to join. So uh, enough editorializing. Um, but my colleague at, at Harvard, Leah Price, was a friend of Jill Lepore. Jill Lepore um, is also a regular staff writer for the New Yorker. So Jill came and wrote an article that appeared uh, in August 2011 in uh, the New Yorker magazine. And it's available on the Dickens Project website if you, if you, are, if you haven't read it and you want to, want to read it. Um, one of the things that was extraordinary about that article is that her deadline for submitting the article to the New Yorker was Friday of the Dickens Universe week. So she was writing the article as it was happening and then had to submit it by Friday of the week when we concluded. So there's nothing in her article about what happened on Friday because that's when she submitted the, the, the article. Um, but it was still a great article. It got us a lot of publicity. And one result of that is that our enrollments, our registrations for the 2012 Dickens Universe are the highest that we have ever had. We started out in Oaks College the first year, and we had about 75 people. Um, after that, we moved to Kresge, and we were at Kresge for a long time. Kresge Town Hall was our, was our site. And then we moved to Porter College, split between Porter College and, and College 8. And our um, general public registrations were, I think the lowest was about 65 people, and the largest we had ever had was maybe in the 120, 125, something like that. This summer, we have 320 people who are uh, coming to the Dickens Universe. Um, about 100 of those are faculty and graduate students, so the remainder are uh, over 200 members of the general public are, are coming uh, this summer. And that, of course, helps us to stay financially solvent. Um, the other thing that happened in the summer of 2011 that was, was truly wonderful is that um, th through Joanna, uh, my, my assistant, we got a group of um, film students from San Francisco State to make a, a video, a promotional video of the, the Dickens Project, of the Dickens Universe. And um, An um, Anna Rotke, Joanna's niece, and two of her film studies uh, buddies from San Francisco State came and did a couple of hundred hours of footage, which they boiled down to an 11-minute promotional video, which is also on the Dickens Project website, and shows us in all of our quirky glory. That is to say, it shows people giving scholarly lectures. It shows people skateboarding on the paths of, of sin. It shows people uh, dancing, Victorian dancing. We, that's how we conclude every, uh, every conference on Friday evening is with live, a live band playing Victorian music and a dance instructor, Angela Elsie, who teaches, in the, teaches French language in the language program here on campus and who is an expert dancer. Um, how many scholarly conferences do people go to where the scholars and the graduate students and the students dance together? Again, uh, so, you know, uh, there are not that many, but, but they, they are unusual. Um, and so when people uh, ask me to describe the, the Dickens universe, I, I say it's, um, it's sort of a, a combination, and all of these are true elements of it, of a, a scholarly conference, a festival, a book club, because everybody is reading the same book, and summer camp. Um, and it's, it is truly all, all of those things. And um, what happens is that people come and they get hooked. Uh, they want to come back. We have one woman who has come 32 years in a row. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I do on the, um, the uh, second day of the Dickens Universe, I don't do it on the first uh, day, is to ask people to raise their hands. How many people have been here three times? How many people have been here five? How many people have been here 10? How many people have been here 20? You know, and there's still hands up in the room. How many people have been here 30 years? And there's still a few people with, with hands up in, in the air. And so the way that the project has, has maintained its vitality, its relevance, 
is in part because of word of mouth. And I think also that now the video is going to help us a lot. Certainly the New Yorker article uh, is helping to publicize who we are and, uh, and what we do. Um, but I think that the, um, the, the future of the Dickens Project is, um, is in pretty good shape. It's in pretty good shape because uh, for a number of reasons. One is that we, we're on a more a sounder basis financially now. Um, we have these 35, 37 universities from around the world who are paying membership fees, including now the UCs, because after we got defunded by the office of the president, we had to go back to the UC campuses and say, you guys are no longer getting a free ride because OP is not paying for it. Um, and what we uh, have to do now, what you have to do, is you have to join on the same basis as the non-UCs, and that means paying the membership fee and paying the way for your uh, participants, the scholars and, and the graduate students. So there were some UCs who have dropped out. San Diego is still in. Irvine and Santa Barbara have dropped out. All of the other UCs are, are members of, of, the, of the Dickens Project. So that's another reason to be hopeful. One other thing that gives me hope about the future, uh, and, and our funding in particular, is that it's no longer uh, just Murray and Ed and John and the guys, and it was mostly men at that point who were the scholars participating in the Dickens Project, but there are younger scholars uh, who see this as a place that they can come and where they can bring their graduate students where they will be plugged into the cutting edge research in not just in Dickens studies, uh, but in Victorian studies uh, more generally. And as an example of that, there's a, a, a young scholar just got hired at the University of Nebraska um, two, three years ago named Pete Capuano. And Pete, um, uh, as part of his startup package at Nebraska, was told that uh, he could have some money uh, to start a little graduate unit in Victorian studies at Nebraska, and he could use that money however he wanted. So the first year, he went to the big um, North American Victorian Studies Association conference, which is one of those conferences like you know, the conferences that we're all familiar with where people come in, they give their papers, they hang out with their buddies, and then on Sunday they leave. And, and graduate students sit and they listen and they say, gee, what do I have to do to learn how to do, uh, you know, to be one of you? And um, so then Pete came to the Dickens universe one summer and saw the advantages of a smaller group of a, uh, of a place where graduate students can talk to graduate students from other universities, where they actually get to know faculty members because they're eating in the dining halls with them, uh, where the, um, I, I, I don't want to claim that the, all of the hierarchies of the academic uh, system are effaced, but if you go to summer camp with somebody, really, it, you know, you, it's, it's a different environment. Um, and uh, so Pete Capuano decided that he would use the startup money for his graduate program in Victorian studies in order to get Nebraska to join the Dickens Project rather than continuing to go to the North American Victorian Studies Association annual meetings. Um, so that's an example. And then we've had, oh, I don't know, about a dozen of the alumni of the project, that is graduate students who got their degrees and went someplace else, who have persuaded their universities to join. So the Dickens Project is a place where younger scholars want to come and want to bring their graduate students. So we now have you know, several generations of, of scholars who are uh, participating in what we do. Um, I've got lots of other stories that I could tell. I'll tell you one story. It's, it's, it's a story um, about the Dickens universe that I think says some interesting, important things about who we are um, and about the ethos or the spirit of the, of the Dickens Project. And it's that we had one fatality. Joanna's going to prompt me. but She's going to give me some water. Thanks. Um, we had one fatality <clears throat> at, the, at the Dickens Universe. Our, um, our audience, the, the um, 
general, members of the general public range in age from 14 to, you know, there's no top limit. Um, we, we're the only um, organization on the campus that has an elder hostel. Elder hostel is no longer called elder hostel. Some of you may know this. It's now called Road Scholars. Uh, <laughs> road Scholars. Um, but back when it was an elder hostel and now, well, it's called Road Scholars, uh, we have that as a, a, a way for people to, to come. Um, and one of the um, people who, who came for several years to the Dickens Universe was a, a woman named Doris Zimpelman. And Doris was about five feet tall and about um, in, in her 80s. And um, Doris walked with a, a shuffle. She, she didn't lift her feet up very high off the ground. She had a cane. And she was always in a hurry. And she, she would shuffle from one thing to another because she didn't want to miss any event that was happening uh, during the week. And on Sunday night um, one year, um, uh, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start again. Uh, uh, Doris, uh, one afternoon, um, Doris died. Uh, Dor Doris had a heart attack, passed away uh, in the um, interval between the afternoon lecture and the, the dinner. And um, so I realized that I had to announce this, because Doris was a character. She was a Dickensian character. She was one of these, you know, everybody, even if they didn't know her name, people knew Doris. Um, uh, and so I knew that that evening at the lecture, I had to announce this fatality, this sad event. And so um, it was a solemn moment. But I had a story to tell. And the story that I had to tell, that I will now tell to you, is about something involving Doris that happened a couple of years before, when Doris had come to the, the Dickens universe. And on Sunday night, after the welcome in the, the first lecture, one of the things that we have is a film, the f usually a film version of the featured novel for that year. And um, so Doris came into the room. It's uh, up at Kresge, room 325. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that room. Um, it's a room with theater-style seating. Um, has good AV equipment. Um, but it has one significant defect, which is that as you enter the room, the, the seats are slightly raked. So the seats in the rear are a little higher. But as you, as you enter on the aisles, there's a little step up. So Doris came in after the film had started, and she was shuffling to find a seat. And she hit that, that step, and she fell. And she hit her head on one of the fixed uh, seats in the, uh, in the room. And of course, we stopped the film. And fortunately, there was a doctor in the room. Um, Doris was bleeding. Um, and uh, she was still conscious, and she said, no, she was OK. She wanted to stay. She wanted to see the film. Um, uh, couldn't we go on? And, and so someone had called 911, and the fire department uh, had come, and they, they wanted to make sure that Doris was OK. And so this big, burly fire department guy uh, came up to, to Doris. This was in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, uh, so he said, Doris, I, Ms. Zimpelman, I don't think he knew her name. He said, I, I need to check you out, make sure that you're, you're OK. Can, can you uh, have, have a few questions I need to ask you? Um, and he said, uh, where are you? And she said, I'm at the project. And the fireman looked a little <laughs> nonplussed. He, and we said, no, 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 that's the right answer. This is the Dickens project, you understand. Um, and he said, OK, um, said, can you tell me what day it is? And she said, it's the first day of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked nonplussed. <laughs> Again, we said, no, 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 that's, that, that's, that's, the, that's the right answer. That's the right answer. And he said, well, I have one more question to, to ask you. He said, who's the president? And she looked at him, and, he, and she said, he's not my president. <laughs> and she said, he said, I, I think you're OK. So, so, so I was able to tell this, this, this story uh, after announcing that, that Doris had, had passed away. And I think it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story because it's a Dickensian story. 
It's a story about a Dickensian character. It's a story, it's a story about storytelling. Um, it's about how storytelling can build community. I think that that's what Dickens is about. I think that's what Dickens, that's why people come back every year to read Dickens. It's why people want to celebrate Dickens on the bicentenary of Dickens's birth, is that there is something very powerful, very healing, very community building about the process of telling stories. And I was able, fortunately, that evening, because I had this, you know, it had been given to me, Doris Zimpleman had been given to me, uh, to tell this story to the audience. And it lifted everyone's spirit. It was, a, it, was a, it was a moment where I felt as if, you know, some Dickens spirit had passed through me out into the audience and had healed us from this, this wound. And um, so I think that, you know, the answer, the, when the journalists called me, um, you know, find, find my name on the internet and say, you know, it's the Dickens bicentenary, I've got to write an article, why are people reading Dickens today? Um, I didn't tell them the Doris Simpleman story, but I, what I said uh, was that, um, you know, Dickens has great narrative gifts, um, Dickens' characters are unforgettable, Dickens is one of the great comic writers of uh, the literature, um, Dickens writes about social themes that are still very relevant today, issues of social justice. But the real reason to keep reading Dickens and the reason that people come back, I think, is that Dickens' language is as exquisite, as beautiful, as unexpected and powerful as the language of any writer in English. And um, all of those things together are, I think, what makes Dickens the center of something that deserves to be called the, the Dickens universe. So that's what I have to tell you. Um, thank you very much. So I, I said that I would answer questions. I, I, I didn't check my time to see how we were doing, but I, th I think we have, John, some, some more time ten to, minutes. yeah, 10 yes, minutes. Ten okay. So. Does anyone have any questions that you would like to ask? Um, and I have a mic here that will circulate in the, in the room. And the mic won't actually amplify your voice, but it will help record it. Could you, could you say a word about uh, the performances that you have had? Because I know you've had Marguerite, so it's more daily, what, whatever has been. Yeah. Yes. Um, on, on the Friday evening of the Dickens Universe, the closing event has been some kind of, of um, festive event. And in recent years, it has been the dance we, with the live music, the dance instructor, and, and Victorian dancing. Um, in other years, it has been a dramatic reading. Uh, I mentioned Philip Collins. And this summer, uh, we will have a performance by Miriam Margulies. Miriam is a British actress. She has an MA in English literature from Oxford. Um, and she is the Dr. Sprout in the Harry Potter movies. She's, she's also about five feet tall and, and a, a Dickensian character. But she has a one-woman show called Dickens's Women that is touring around the world this year. Uh, and she will perform this summer at the Dickens Universe uh, as a special event. Um, so we've also had a Dickens puppet show. We've had a magic lantern show, um, various other performances uh, over the years. Yes, I, I, I organized that event where Paul read. And uh, one of the other, you know, I, I didn't have time to mention everything that is a spin-off of the Dickens Project. Uh, in the early years of the project, we had a performance group called the Dickens Players. And Kate Rickman um, uh, was the script writer, and um, Jean Lewis and uh, um, Robert, Fenwick. Robert Fenwick and Simon... 
mm, Simon. Uh, and, but Paul Whitworth was a member of the, of the Dickens Players. And uh, recently we, um, and, and they did readers' theater versions of uh, scenes from Dickens' novels. And recently in San Francisco at the Mechanics Institute Library, we had a day-long Dickens Festival day, which I gave a talk, Murray gave a talk, and the closing event was a performance by Paul Whitworth, who read a script uh, from a Tale of Two Cities. Yes. So. You used a sentence that um, Time Magazine also had, and I don't know whether it borrowed it from you or <coughs> whether you borrowed it from Time Magazine, but I believe it expresses a consensus now, namely that uh, Dickens is the greatest writer of the English language outside of perhaps Shakespeare. And um, six decades ago, I don't think people would have so readily assented to that proposition. Somerset Maugham, for example, wrote about 10 great novelists and their novels. <coughs> Four of them are the English language. Dickens is not among them. That's just one example among many. Dickens is thought to be too popular, perhaps, uh, too, too easy to assimilate, too uh, over <coughs> disposed to overuse characterizing sentences, and so on. Uh, how do you account for the quite extraordinary shift? Extraordinary is a mistake. How do you account for the shift uh, from that somewhat patronizing view of Dickens to uh, a statement that you could make without expecting any real consensus? Well, there, there's a long answer to the question, and uh, I'll, I'll try and give a, a short answer. I mean, the history of the reception of, of Dickens is an interesting subject in its own right. Um, Dickens was, in his own time, uh, enormously popular, read by all segments of the population. Uh, in, the, at the, in, in the Edwardian period, the beginning of the 20th century, he fell into disfavor as a result of um, the reaction by Virginia Woolf, not so much Woolf, but uh, Henry James and, and others who uh, believed that Dickens was just a popular entertainer, that his, he, his craft, he was not a craftsman of the novel. Um, uh, James wrote elaborate theoretical prefaces to his novels and talked about Dickens's novels as being loose, baggy monsters. I mean, they were without form, without, without structure. Um, so Dickens went out of style for about 40, 50 years. And then starting in the, and, and F.R. Leavis in England wrote a, a, a very influential book called The Great Tradition, which was uh, uh, the tradition in English literature of moral seriousness. And Dickens did not belong in the, the tradition of moral, moral seriousness. George Eliot was the great uh, 19th century English novelist. And then um, starting in the 19, late 1940s and early 1950s with George Orwell and Edmund Wilson in this country, there was a revival of interest in Dickens that saw that um, there were other ways to think about his social conscience and to think about his language and to think about his characterizations that used other critical techniques, including psychoanalysis, to, to talk about his works. And so uh, all the modern theoretical approaches that have developed since that time apply very wonderfully to Dickens. So, so Dickens, is, Dickens is one of the few writers uh, around whom you could organize something like the Dickens universe, uh, that is, a writer who remains at once accessible to the general public and of great interest to uh, academic scholars. Uh, and um, I, I don't think there's any other writer. Shakespeare accepted. Uh, I don't even think that Mark Twain or Jane Austen is, is in the same league. Also, Dickens' nor novels are enormous. I mean, enormous not just in their own size, but in the scope of, of what they undertake. You can read them on the airplane, too. John, you said that there's nobody obvious to pass you a baton to here. Do you have any sense for how much what you just said translates into the amount of Dickens talk at the secondary and tertiary level now in the U.S.? Um, one of the things is maybe evident in what I've said that, that 
the Dickens Project is trying to do is to promote the appreciation and teaching of Dickens at the secondary level. So we do, in addition to having the high school teacher workshop, we also have a high school essay contest that is nationwide and that brings every year two high school students and their teachers to Santa Cruz for the, the Dickens Project, uh, for the Dickens Universe. But um, the study of Dickens at the secondary level is in decline, and it's partly because the study of Dickens at the college and university level is in decline, despite my best efforts. Um, and so it's, um, it's a surprise to me and a disappointment that there are high school teachers who have not read Dickens. Um, and so um, if the teacher hasn't read Dickens, then the teacher students are not going to read Dickens. And so many high school English classes uh, read Romeo and Juliet, and then they jump to um, you know, the 20th century. Uh, to the Great Gatsby or something like that, and there's there's really nothing in between. Length is certainly one obstacle, um, but the approach to teaching Dickens, one of the approaches that we promote is to read Dickens in serial installments. That is, that Dickens published his novels serially. They didn't publish, you know, thousand-page books. He published them in installments that came out over uh, a period of 19 months. And then secondly, to read Dickens aloud, because Dickens is, is very theatrical. Dickens is very performative himself uh, and adapted his novels for public reading. So those are the two best ways to promote Dickens. I was very encouraged last summer that um, we made a connection with a, um, uh, a high school in South Central Los Angeles that heard about us and that got together some money to send two students to, uh, to the Dickens universe, um, an African-American young woman and a Latina uh, young woman who came. And they uh, actually read Great Expectations and came, and they had a wonderful time. And the, um, the Latina, both of them had gone on to, to college. One of them is at a community college down in Southern California, and the, the other student is at Yale. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I still have hope that, that Dickens, if, if any 19th century writer is accessible, um, uh, I think that it is Dickens. I think probably we've kind of run out of time. Yeah. I, I, I met my old high school teacher, <laughs> Dickens Institute, and had a wonderful time with him. And I think we really appreciate your, the scope and hope that. You survive and prosper. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.